I regret the fact I, I, had, I had another plan for this. Uh, there's this uh, company in California called Suitable Technologies that makes uh, wheelchairs for the mind, essentially avatars that you can stuff yourself in and go anywhere with. Um, and I tried to work it out first with Ed Snowden and second with Julian Assange. Uh, for both of them to come and be, or either one of them to come and be here with me, Julian finally got cold feet about 10 minutes ago because he couldn't tell how he was going to come across. <laughs> you know, he, the machine was too short. <laughs> you, you know, when you have heroes, you have to, you have to take their weaknesses with their strengths. Uh, but in any case, I'm sorry they're not here. Uh, I think it would, have, it would have been delightful to introduce them to you so you get a, a sense of who they actually are, but, but you got me. And, uh, and I am definitely as good a representative of what they care about as I could be without being incarcerated. And that may come. But I'll tell you what I care about. I started with Esther here. I started the Electronic Frontier Foundation back in 1990. And Mitch Kapor and I and John Gilmore and then Esther and Stuart Brand wanted this to be an organization that would vouchsafe freedom of expression, would maintain the internet in a condition where anybody anywhere could express him or herself and distribute that expression infinitely to all those who might be interested in hearing it without anything getting in the way. Uh, knowing full well that much of it would consist of cat videos. Uh, nevertheless, we were dedicated to that complete openness of sharing of anything that might be relevant to human, human understanding of uh, or knowledge. At the same time, we were very concerned about privacy. And there's been a tension between these two things that has operated all along. We were trying to protect people's privacy even as we were trying to protect their ability to, even as we were trying to protect their right to know. And I want you to think about that a little bit because it's a, it's a right that has never been promulgated before, because it simply wasn't possible to extend. But we believe that human beings have a right to know about all matters that pertain to their affairs, everything their government is doing, everything that the scientific world is discovering, anything that may be of interest to them should not be confined from their knowledge because they're unfit for it for some reason or another. Now, that runs into privacy in several different ways. I mean, we may believe in the right to know, but I don't personally want to assert the right to know whether or not you have HIV. Uh, and I want to be able to protect that knowledge as, as you seek to protect it or anything else that you personally seek to protect about yourselves. Uh, what I eventually realized was that it wasn't a direct conflict between serving the right to know and serving privacy. It was actually something more subtle than that. It was a conflict between gradually mediating the increasing loss of privacy, which is electronically enabled in so many ways now that, you know, everything you do leaves a digital slime trail of you that can be coiled back up and do everything but dance the way you do. Uh, that it, it can be said that 
there are a lot of people inside institutions who can and do know more about you than you know by quite a measure. Uh, and this puts them in a condition of authority with regard to you, which is, which is actually quite sensitive. You know, I, w I was listening to the previous speaker talking about how, you know, basically there's an easy way and a hard way, and that she talked about all the easy ways in which it might be able to justify turning into a spy against her friends. And she turned all of those down, and then they just kept cranking it up. Uh, and the fact is that if you have a lot of information about somebody, and you want them to do more, you want them to, to reveal their friends' information, you want them to do any number of things, you can start cranking that up and you have a lot of leverage there. If you are a secretive institution. And so the real problem I, I realized was not, the, was not the loss of privacy, because I, I sort of gave privacy up as a, as a lost cause to begin with. I, I mean, I come from a really small town in Wyoming, and everybody there knows everything about everybody else there. For better or worse, I mean, we have mutually assured destructive capacity. If you want to start rattling the skeletons in my closet, I know where your bodies are buried. So it's just as well that we leave it to be. You know, unless we have some good reason to do so. Uh, we, and, and we have that kind of packed at unspoken quality of community with each other. But we have no such pact with the NSA, the CIA, the insurance company, the IRS, da, 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 da. Uh, the uh, RIAA, the MPAA. Unfortunately, it's a rather long list of increasingly secretive institutions that are getting better and better about hiding what they're looking for, what judgments they may seek to levy, who they consider to be a good guy and who they consider to be a bad guy, and what they would rather have said and what they would rather not have said. And I also, I mean, I've been a double agent for a long time. Esther and I, when was that, 91? When we went down to the CIA? Yeah, Esther, Esther and I and Vince Cerf and Mitch Kapor went down, no, it must have been a little later because the World Wide Web existed. So it was probably 93 or something like that. We went down there with the idea of convincing the CIA that information was essentially a gift economy and if they wanted to get more information, the best thing they could do would be to give information out, because they had a lot of it. And they freaked out. I mean, they, they were so retrograde. I mean, like Esther, they were sort of stripping away recording devices from us. And Esther pulls out, this will be quaint, a floppy disk. And she says, I suppose this is a recording device. She says, oh yeah, you'll have to turn that over. Well, meanwhile, in my, in my laptop, I had a recording device, which was a hard disk and a microphone and a camera. <laughs> I didn't mention it. I wasn't as good a citizen as Esther. Uh, and uh, so they let me have that. And at, at that time, they were so retrograde that they were actually moving information around in the building in, in uh, vacuum tubes. You know, like in the old department store where you put the thing in the, in the tube and stick it into this air shaft and go boom. And you would, you would think this was maybe for tempest protection, but unfortunately, no. That was just the best way they had to do it. And, uh, and they also had at the heart of the CIA 
they had this unbelievable system where there was a big lazy Susan and six analysts and they had large, large print teletypes and that were rattling away about various things, drugs, South America, Europe. I, I, I thought that it was interesting that drugs had its own continent. Uh, and if something came out that they thought would be a relevance to one of the other analysts, they'd rip it off, put it on the Lazy Susan and turn it over to them. There were five TV monitors on the wall Four of them were showing uh, static and one of them was showing CNN. And here we were at the nerve center of the CIA. <laughs> I mean, it was way more like Brazil than Bond. And I took it upon myself from that point forward to try to help out. Because I felt like one of the things that the intelligence agencies did and were incredibly bad at was figuring out what the hell was actually going on in the world. I mean, you could, you could go back through the history of American intelligence and you could not find a single thing that they had called right. From the Chinese crossing the Yalu River to Hungarian invasion to the Czech invasion to... <laughs> I mean, they just systematically had it wrong. I mean, the fall of the wall, if you'd gone down to the CIA in the, in the late fall of 1989, you would have been able to enlist approximately five people that would have believed that the wall was gonna come down by Christmas. On the day of 9-11, there was one person in the CIA that spoke Arabic. And, uh, you know, probably 25,000 people that spoke Russian. So I took it upon myself to try to get these guys to understand how information really worked. Uh, because there was a group of them that was kind of open to the idea, and there was also a group of them in both the NSA and the, and the CIA that cared about constitutional rights. And so I spent a lot of what has turned out to be completely fruitless time consulting to them about how useful it would be to do this in the clear and to quit having these silos that make it impossible to understand what, what's going on anywhere because you can't vet the information. And instead what they do is they make themselves more secretive. I mean, at the NSA, every single paragraph of an email has to be classified. You can imagine how that speeds communications. Uh, and they're just kind of hopeless at it. But they are really, really good at gathering data, and it turns out that the cheapest way to get data is just simply take the feed and split it, prism-like, and take all of the incoming light of all of the telecommunications in all of the world and run it into big hard disks in Bluff, Utah. Now, this is on the principle that if we get it all, then maybe someday God will endow us with the ability to sort it out. Uh, that we'll get better magnets for the, for the needles in that haystack. That we will not impair ourselves by building exponentially larger haystacks. Uh, and once again, I think we will be spared their incompetence, or spared their, their despotism by their incompetence. Because this isn't going to work very well, but the possibility that it might is something that we all need to be extremely mindful of. Because what these guys, in good conscience, I mean, they started coming to me in, in 2005 and saying, we're developing capabilities that, that we think are possibly not constitutional and we're using them anyway and what do you think and <laughs> I mean there was a guy named John Poindexter who was hounded out for the the total information awareness program yen and CIA asked me to come down and speak in, De in December about a lot of the issues that, that Mr. Snowden has now made so visible 
And Poindexter was exactly as appalled as I was. I mean, we sang the same hymn in a different key, and I was a little surprised at that. And in fact, many of the people in the audience felt like humming along. And yet the machine itself, because it could, was rendering into its capacities the ability to create turnkey totalitarianism. That the second that you had people that were in charge of that machine, you would have the ability to basically use everything that could be known about them because you would have it. You couldn't necessarily grab it at the time, but you could go back into the thing and get it. And this is very dangerous. And so what, what my friends Julian and, and Ed have done, I mean, and, and, and Ed, I, I will take some small credit for because uh, uh, I started a foundation in last December with Daniel Ellsberg and Laura Poitras and Glenn Greenwald, Shenny Jardin and John Cusack to fund WikiLeaks and anything else that came up like WikiLeaks. And we just decided we would do this even if it meant we might go to jail. And we're doing it. We've raised half a million dollars or more than, more than half a million dollars for the support of leaking. And I recommend to you uh, freepressfoundation.org. You can toss in 10, 10 euros and it will make a difference. But here's the deal. We have reached a point where we really have to insist that our cowardly government stand up to its responsibilities. And as intelligent people who know about this, we have no alternative but to be continuously pointing out to the larger mass of the populace that it is not morally defensible to go on pretending to be asleep, which is what most people are doing. As the Navajo Indians say, you can't awaken somebody who's pretending to be asleep. Yes, you can, actually, but you have to be very, very assertive about it, and we have to be very assertive about it. Because there has to become a symmetry between the loss of personal privacy and the loss of institutional secrecy. I'm fine with not having any privacy as long as I know exactly what they're doing with my information. And, and that is the issue. Yeah. And I want to know why they're doing it. I want to know, I want to know what kinds of, of moral vectors they're operating on because they don't tell me. You know, I know that, I know that they seem to have an institutionally different view of drugs than I do. Uh, and God knows what else. Now, I don't hold myself out as being the person whose freedoms ought to be most preserved <laughs> since much of mine consists of license. But um, anyway, that is, that is what I came here to tell you. I think it is incredibly urgent, and I, I actually don't like broadcast media, and I find that I've been one longer than I wanted to be here, and I would like to, I would like to turn this into a conversation for the little time that we have left, if we could have uh, comments or tirades or questions or, I mean, short tirades. <laughs> Anybody want to say something, and we'll give you a mic. I know how this is in Germany. <laughs> Hi, uh, Christian Stöcker here from Spiegel magazine. I have, I have one question. So you're obviously very passionate about these issues and you've been for, for many years. But the rest of your country, not so much somehow. Why is that? The rest of my country is, as I say, pretending to be asleep. And the reason they're pretending to be asleep is because they have bought into this grotesquely wrong notion of the threat of terrorism. In fact, even counting 
an American is statistically far more likely to die from lightning while golfing than to a terrorist attack. I mean, more people have been killed by television sets falling on them over the last 10 years than have been killed by terrorist attack. And yet, we think it is necessary for us to guard ourselves against this terrible terrorism because somehow Roger Ailes and company, for example, managed to get all the people with Foxheimer's disease completely enchanted with neuro-linguistic programming. And moreover, the government has fallen prey to the not on my watch syndrome, which is they think about all the horrible things that could happen. And you know, the imagination has no shortage of horrible things that can happen. Uh, and they just cannot abide the possibility that somebody might, you know, stroll into the island of Manhattan with an especially large suitcase that would turn out to be a, you know, 55 kiloton nuclear device. That could happen. I don't think it will. I mean, there was a point where there was a lot of stray plutonium loose in the world. And I personally know how to make a, a, a nuclear weapon if I've got five and a half kilograms of, of plutonium. And um, uranium's better, by the way, but uh, it's, it's not hard to do. And I, but what never came together was, was the, the enhanced uranium and the technical ability and the craziness that was willing to do that. Because you may be willing to blow yourself up for all those virgins, but you're not necessarily willing to, to fry several million people. That's a tall thought. Do you think there's hope of uh, getting rid of the TSA? Uh, probably not in the immediate future. I mean, uh, God, I mean, look how many people that were unemployable that have jobs there now. I mean, <laughs> you know, and look, look at, I mean, these people, they've been having to deal with smart asses like me all their lives, and the best they ever were able to do before was be the, like the eighth grade hall monitor. Now they can do all kinds of stuff to me, and I can't do a damn thing about it. And I, you know, I frankly admit that I'm on their side a little bit. <laughs> Finally, they, you know, finally they get a chance. Uh, take away of freedom because we are not allowed to even remark back. We can be pulled out of line for oh, the slightest snicker. Oh, I remarked snicker. back. What? I remarked back. I often wear a little pin that says suspected terrorist. <laughs> and, and when they ask about it, I say, well, if I'm not a suspected terrorist, why, do you, why are you doing this? <laughs> uh, I... Thank you so much. Okay.